Welcome to This Commerce Life. We are an unscripted podcast dedicated to small businesses and entrepreneurs in the retail and consumer packaged goods space in Canada and the United States. I am Phil Chang, co-host and co-founder. And I'm Kenny Venucci, co-host and co-founder of This Commerce Life. Our love is the journey to retail, and our passion is sharing that with you every week. All things digital, really. So I've I've got um, I've got digital digital marketing, kind of like start to finish, like full stack marketing. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm also teaching classic marketing, as well as professional selling skills. Um, so that's what I'm teaching this summer. And then usually I teach uh, SEO as well, uh, SEO SEM in the fall, and Omni Channel in the spring. So that's awesome. Very cool. Uh, it's um it's pretty fun like it kind of keeps you on your toes and then it um you know it's uh it it also like allows me to stay on top of the research and the tools and Mm kind of what's coming and you know like find myself in the heart of like an ai conversation like all the time right so yeah yeah. yeah. i know i was just actually looking up some some training on ai because i feel like i've been the dumbest guy in the room for a few months now and i'm like and actually i you know i'm not i'm not that dumb but all of a sudden someone will say something you're like oh gotta write that down i'm gonna go look that up <laughs> yeah maybe, the... <laughs> maybe some research on yeah. that one might be in order uh, yeah i feel exactly. like you can't do enough though because it's just it's moving at this rate and i think <clears throat> like it's funny because as humans we just we can't find moderation like i i don't know i guess i wasn't around when spreadsheets really started but did we do this like when excel came out or like lotus one two three do you know what i mean like did it, someone I, go it was this it is was it. it's Co- over you yeah, know like, Corel draw Corel draw right? changed everything it was just yeah like, you can draw on your computer <laughs> at home it was uh, all, it was epic it was like, crazy but you know what the funny with this one? Because this one transcends everybody. Like when Corel Draw came out, that was for a group over here. Mm. Like I remember using Lotus One Two Three, or um, yeah. actually, what was there was one before Lotus that? Notes? No. Uh, no, there was one before One Two Three. It was um, VCalc or some stupid thing like okay. that. Okay. And it was the same idea, but at that time, yeah, if you were in university doing spreadsheets or an accountant, that world got turned upside down. Yeah. The difference, I think, with this one, it's 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 impacting everybody all at once similar probably to what the facebook idea when it went mental in that time you know it went from zero to a million then a million to a billion and the million to billion was like lightning fast Mm -hmm. it's sort of like that and there's policies and how do you manage this and what's going to be acceptable i got my my goddaughters uh um developing policy in the states or trying to develop policy with a bunch of think tanks uh, and then pitching to government etc and saying you know, what do we do with this thing? Do we let it run amok or because yeah, it's and, and AI is coming into the food space hard and heavy, not just from the data side, but from operations, from marketing, from yeah. you know, you name it. And um yeah. it's interesting. There's 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 this camp already and it at first I thought it was an age thing where like oh there's sort of like and I might be writing that line a little bit where like oh there's probably an age of a person where they're just not really into it, but it isn't that way at all it kind of comes down to an appetite for exploration and um, kind of um, creative muckery where it's like, okay, your first few attempts in chat GPT were like, oh, okay, whatever. It's like a tricked out, you know, Google search. And then you start to layer in your, you know, your prompts and then you start to throw questions at it in, you know, in more creative ways. You start learning about how people are prompting it. And then you start hearing about some of these other AI tools that are coming into the mix. And it's this, what seems like it probably, you know, it's just this constant layering, but it's almost like every few days you hear about something else that someone normal has yeah. done. No, I'm yeah. talking about scientists and like, no, although I'm talking about like your Everyday friend, Joe, your like friend this. just pumped this out of chat GPT right. or whatever, or some AI generator, yeah. or they were using Adobe <clears throat> and Adobe's new AI feature was cranking out something. It's like, it is like, it's in the mix. So it's a, uh, it's really interesting stuff. The um, you're, when it comes to teaching at colleges, I did a few rounds, yeah. a few years at uh, Langara College uh, oh. and um, uh, Van Arts, 
Okay. And um, Capilano Idea, uh, Capilano University's Idea Program, yeah. and a few other things. And one of the things I really miss about those times is that when you're talking to students, they're they're sort of they're they're sponges. They're so willing to learn because they're so eager to get hired, either right now yeah. or once they graduate. Right. And then you end up, you know, years later, you see them in the workforce, and that light has sort of gone out of their eyes. So they've, yeah. they've had yeah. too many spreadsheets. Yeah. Right. They've had too many reports yeah. or too many meetings, or 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 they sort of feel like you know they just they don't know how to really combine their passions with what they're doing, or they haven't found that mix for themselves. And that's I wish outside of all the technical and all the stuff that we want to teach them in these schools. I'd love to teach students one day, maybe we'll, you know, I'll have a little um, compound somewhere off in some island in the strait where we can just say like, all right, your passion is important. Let's find ways for you to either use it or protect it and work on it separately. Just don't lose your fire. Uh, and that's a gap I see. But, anyway. that's, but that's really cool, right? Because you're right. Like we, it's kind of sad because I guess we get it from like the opposite like you know what i mean like we get the beginning so i get the the kids at the beginning and they're amazing they want to get in they you know they think they can change everything and then kenny and i run into some of them at the end of their cpg careers where they're you know kind of limping through <laughs> trying to figure yeah. out you know like sometimes yeah. it's it's like i've been doing this so long i don't know what else is out there and then like those kind of like those always hurt a little bit right because you kind of go one, you have no idea the skills that you have at your disposal and what it really means in real life anymore, right? Because you've, you've spent your life kind of running through a CPG mill, if you will, um, or a treadmill. And then you, you kind of go, no, but, and, and just as human being, it, it, it hurts, right? Because, you know, you're so full of like, you've just got smart, smart brains in you. How do we help you figure out like what you might love, right? Or like not, yeah, you know, it's, that, it's, that whole it's, thing, right? It's like, tough though as you yeah. get older and the longer you do something. Cynicism is just built in, I think, to the psyche of a human and, and all that stuff. And what you really got to try to do is like a lot of the stuff like might be kind of scary or you're not too sure. But the more you learn, I think that's the, I think that's what happens. I think the ones you find, we were both talking about, is when you get to the end and people are still or they've lost that spark completely and they've got, like I said, all this knowledge, you kind of think, you know, come on, if you guys – there's so much cool shit you could do. Mm -hmm. Like, just do it. Did you lose me? No. Nope. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's yeah. my, I thought my mic got busted out there. But just, if, if, I just find they get bored. Maybe it's, maybe it's not cynicism. Maybe it's boredom. Or maybe it's just um, that you're not as relevant in the room as you might have once been. But I think you own that. I think that's still up to you to find that spark and what gets you excited. There's so much cool shit happening. Mm -hmm. And people need to know things. And sometimes, you know, the older you get, the, the the maybe the more wisdom you potentially have, and you should yeah. be able to respark. I, I would hope, anyway. Yeah, you, you think so? I in 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 my role, uh, I sort of I, I get I get paid to work with people. I get paid to connect people. Right. I make a I make a living from making professional friends. Right. Um, and of course, that obviously has its, you know, business development angle to it because that's just part of. Let's just be honest. It's there's a part yeah. of it. Absolutely. But. You know, I've been asked many times over the last few months, like, you know, is is AI going to take away my job? Okay. Well, I think I'd be stupid to say no. I think we should all be aware of how, you know, technology uh, comes into play. For sure. But the, the reality is, is that uh, there's a certain irre <laughs> irrelevance to everything that we do. It's what 100%. passion can often push through some of those barriers and irrelevance might be one of them or apathy might be another one. Or, you know, there's this sort of, do you remember when Gary Vaynerchuk really hit the scene? Um, I feel like that might be 20 years ago now, <laughs> but yeah. when he came out with this crush it book and he just talked about like doing things differently. It sparked in a lot of people. He had a layer of say maybe Timothy Ferris, you know, those two guys yep. and everything that they said and how they did it. Like it just changed everything and their work didn't change, but how they did it changed. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of opportunity now to lean into some of these technologies and kind of go, well, I'm going to grow and change just like how my industry is growing and changing. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to add on to it something that I can't shut up about. So let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah. I love it.
Yeah. And I, I think, it. you know, again, you know what, maybe it's some of it too. It's like, I, I find that like Phil and I've had some, some guests on, and I find sometimes you got to get out of your peer group too. Like staying with people, like, if, you know, I'm 57. If I hang out with straight 57 year olds, we may talk about AI and we may do certain things, but you know, if you really want to keep yourself alive, like, like work with younger people, like work with the 25 and 35 year olds, their, mm -hmm. their view of the world is completely different and it's different. It's cool. And I yeah. find for me, that's what energizes me. I, I like working with the younger people because they push you or they push me anyway, because I'm three or four generations on top of them now, you know, mm -hmm. how the generation gap's so tight. And so I like it. I think it's okay. Well, shit, I never thought of that way. I'll try this. I mean, I may not do all of it because I still want them to do half the work, but you know, that's a whole different. And every industry too has inbreeding. CPG is sure. no exception. There's oh, no a problem. lot of inbreeding <laughs> going on and everyone's just PPG popping. is eight left turns, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Literally. So like you think about maybe a year and a half ago when, you know, every food brand was going after the, uh, the brand, like the next shiny CMO. Yeah. And they were all the CMOs were just like flying around. Everyone's getting bigger paychecks and yeah. they were just kind of spinning the machine. Yeah. Um, but the the scary part is is that when you talk to someone who's been in, in any industry and they've been in it for a while and their inputs are all the same and their webinars are all the same, and their conferences are all the same, and books they read, they're all the same. It's like, you know what you could be learning from consulting? You know what you could be learning from um from B to C in in like home hardware or like home housewares or you could be learning from from food service or what you could be learning from um you know the creative arts or the performance art industries like there's so many ways that you can take something some nugget you've learned from in marketing what some ugly real estate poster you know those real estate yeah. where they have their dog yeah. and their little halo and they've got whatever the real estate marketing is disgusting but it works and at times and when it does work why what triggers, you know, what you can exactly. learn from that and apply in another category or whatever. But inbreeding freaks me out. And I, I spend a lot of time in the creative industries and man, the creative industries where like designers are just, they have their favorites that they follow and they just regurgitate the, from their favorite designer and their favorite brand. And you're like, oh, please yeah. widen your view here. Just go talk to somebody different, like find a different different angle a different color a different anything man just yeah like just bust out even that much would be huge like just yeah. do something different yeah but i think that's what happens i think you know but i think that's again probably a human thing is comfort is nice and as you get longer into things that comfort and that stability is like a lot of times what you're shooting for the sad part is it doesn't it doesn't foster creativity it doesn't foster growth it doesn't foster new knowledge mm -hmm. it doesn't foster excitement or necessarily passion it can but for the most part, it does seems to squash all of that, which is the shitty part, right? But yeah. I don't know, man. Um, we should do an intro so people know who you are. Kenny, do you want to do an intro? I'll do a very light one because I don't really know much a lot about Corwin because we only met at uh, one of the events through BC Food and Beverage. Um, he did it as some talking and we sat and I thought, I like this guy. I'm curious to see what the hell he's done then he flipped into like you've done you've been in marketing for a long time you've had your own company you still have your own company that's right that does a lot of that stuff you can tell us that in a moment you also now are vp strategic um with uh, ethical food group if i'm not yep. mistaken that's right right um which has a whole different story which would be very cool to listen to but i think what i was more impressed with is that you've been around for a long time and yet even the way you're talking now, like you're still trying to stay and be relevant which is the part i think phil and i love the most about the people in this industry. As much as we just picked on them in a bit, a little bit, there are a whole ton who want to try to do different every day. So Corwin, um, really, I the next 45 minutes or so is yours. Wherever you wanna go, you go. But I'd love to know more about uh, where you came from. I mean, who you are, obviously, where you came from, why this, uh, why Ethical Food Group, why CPG still, I mean, Phil and I ask ourselves that pretty much every day, and we're still not too sure the answer to that one. So <laughs> perhaps you can shine some light that maybe it'll reflect on us. I don't know. Sure, I don't but know. Anyway. I think it's it's all personal. It's all it's the uh, so. All right, so my my background, I I stumbled into marketing like just total face plant. It came from I did a lot of work when I was uh, first out of high school, I kind of stumbled into youth work and, you know, summer camps and kids camps and working with teenagers. And at one point I ended up as a like licensed minister 
in a church plant in Kelowna in a small church. And I was oh, like, wow. Pastor Corey. Pastor Corey. So I'm Pastor going pretty Corey. far back here. I'm going, wow. I, I'll, I'll, yeah. So I don't uh, mind that title. Maybe yeah, we should kind of cool. call you that, Pastor Corey. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm backslidden now, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so six years of that, that is the hardest job I have ever done ever in my life. Uh, when you're, I was in my twenties, early twenties, and I was getting paid to run, you know, kids programs and youth programs through a church. And, uh, you know, you don't get paid very much and you have volunteers who are very busy and you have no budget and the expectations on you, you know, grow every day. Uh, and you have to do a lot of public speaking when you're in that type of role. You're just always in front of people, kids and families and schools and programs and camps. And, and you're always sort of at the front of the room. And so after six years of that, I actually, at one point, my wife walked into my office and I was like a ball of tears on the floor. I was just crying. Here I am, 25 years old, 26 years old, crying because I was just overwhelmed. I was like burned out. And it was, it, I, it was just a really hard job. A lot of expectations, a lot of kids struggling, a lot of, you know, it's just hard work. So I, I ended up stepping away from that. I'm like, well, what do I want to, like, I kind of fell into this. So if I was to be intentional about my career, what do I really want to do? I'm like, I love, I love creative work. I love design. I love marketing. And I started to sort of pursue that. And it was very, very um, quickly. I realized that it was sort of the, the business side of marketing, sort of the, uh, and the business side of creative work that really got me excited. So when I, uh, Eileen and I moved down to uh, Vancouver from Kelowna and I started going to Langara College, I uh, hadn't really done much schooling. So I'm like, I really want to um, kind of get back into, uh, into the academic side. Loved my time at Langara. And during that time, I ended up with uh, Ascentis Consulting Group, which worked as a consultant firm uh, in event production, event marketing for Microsoft. And it's sort of, I got thrown into this like, because they kept saying, well, can you do this? I'm like, well, I've done it with volunteers and no budget. I bet you I can do it with a paid staff and a budget. And just producing events for Microsoft, I learned so much so quickly. And um, there was a combination of a production and event you know, planning and marketing and, and business planning and a, li a little bit of everything. And so that journey, oh, boy, I'm really doing the timeline here. Holy crap. Anyway. Yeah, boys, keep uh, going. Just it's just going. Okay. It is it's what cool. it is, right? You I like it. I, I can just, follow I like linear. It. Okay. <laughs> so um, my time at Microsoft uh, was really, I just sort of went, you know, the best belly of the beast, especially, you know, a number of years ago where Apple was still you know, kind of working yeah. its way up. And I was in the belly of the beast at Microsoft. And I really started to feel like, you know, there's, as much as I want to help, you know, Microsoft do its thing, um, there's other businesses and other organizations and charities and nonprofits that, you know, if I was to help them, that would make me really excited. I'd be really excited about that. So I transitioned. I started my own company and uh, started doing event production, event marketing for mostly nonprofits. And, uh, and then, of course, as soon as you're around uh, in the event industry, you're always around creative people. You're around performers and artists and technical directors and people in lighting and people in design and people in marketing. And so my, my creative and marketing network just exploded. And as I'm producing events and doing all these things, it was those individual artists and creatives that really got me excited. That's where I'm like, oh my gosh, these people are amazing. Um, and so I, I started to transition yet again to helping those people thrive in business and sort of being their de facto agent or manager or COO and kind of helping them run their creative businesses. And I wrote that for a while. I was, had an opportunity to write a book for a big U.S. publisher. And so that sort of put me onto the, onto the creative industry scene and into the industry market there. And um, it, was, uh, it was in that experience where after about 10 or 12 years, I'm like, you know, I love working for creative with people like with creative people, but it was sort of the team dynamic that I was starting to miss. I was starting to get, you know, isolated <laughs> working with individual, you know, freelancers and solopreneurs. And I'm like, I really crave that team. So I reached out to a friend, uh, Braden Douglas at crew, crew food and beverage marketing. I'm like, you know, I think I can bring my mojo to what you guys are doing with entrepreneurs and founders. And, and they had a lot of food and beverage clients at that time, obviously. And I'm like, I think I'm really liking that jam. And, 
you know, I started with crew and, and I kept my company tandem, T A E N D E M tandem.com. I kind of keep that off to the side. We have a, a small roster and a small team that supports them, but I really wanted to, for myself, kind of get into agency like life and work with a team and coming into crew is just an absolute riot. But the pandemic hit within the first three weeks, like my first three weeks on the job went from like boardroom meetings and handshakes and whiteboards and, you know, razzle dazzle to like elbow bumps, fist pumps, yeah. you know, and then zoom for three years. Um, yeah. So it was, uh, it was a bit of a, wasn't quite the jam. rough transition. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. quite, you know, what I was going for at the time. But that experience, and this ties back to what we were talking about before on passion, um, finally was able to get to Expo West a while ago. Right. And when I walked, I walked into Expo <laughs> West for the first time, I'd never seen a trade show that big. I've certainly never been around that many food people, but I walked into those doors and I got hit with that wave of, you know, that smell of sugar and plant-based meat stuff and all these weird smells and all this, all this cacophony that is Expo West. And my first thought was, these are my people. I, I want it. to be around these people. Maybe not that person, maybe not that one. In general, <laughs> in general. general. But in general, it's like, yes. okay, CBG people, these are my people, and especially you know, the food and beverage people. And then the more time I spent in food and beverage, it was like, oh, man, the, the people that are like chicken plastic and doing regenerative farming and that they're helping communities and they're doing some of those really hard things that the earth needs, that our world needs, those are the people that really get me excited. And so when when Bob and Rick from uh, Ethical Food Group kind of came knocking and their side project was going to turn into something bigger, um, you know, and they kind of said, Corbin, we think, you know, you're the right fit for where we want to go. It was just, it was a hell yes. It was just like, I, I'm in. This is too cool. So anyway, I know there was a bit of a, a meandering meandering path of of my life, but the the short answer is, I, when I'm around the blood, sweat, and tears of founders, that's the pool I want to swim in. I love, I love being around founders and people that are really care deeply, not only about their business, but about the <clears throat> impact that their business can have and that it's baked into their strategy and that right. they're the brands. If they go to scale, they're the brands that steal market share from brands that are not helping the earth and they're not helping communities. And a little philanthropy is not going to cut it. Right. Um, I get excited about growing those kinds of brands. No, oh, it's super exciting. I um, I you know it's funny uh, because um, when I was looking at at your you know ethical food group in particular, like we we had talked to Bob as one of the fast thoughts um, leading up to the Food Pro twenty three, and um, I think we're we were we were kind of we we're fanning out because the 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 folks that you're working with. Um, I think with ethical food group, like we just love some of these brands, right? Like we're just such a huge fan of them. And I think that excitement you've got at the end there, we just, we, we fucking love it, man. Like I just, I love this industry. I'm, I love this industry. I love yeah. these folks that are doing just amazing things. So I think um, we could tie in my first, my first yeah. expo was 2000. And at that time, cause you've now been at that time, when you walked into the upstairs, it was three quarters full. Mm. By 2020, 2002, 2003, finally went to half basement. And we thought at that time, this show was out of control. It's like ridiculously huge. And it's gone nuts since there. But I get your total feeling. The vibe you get from the people and a lot of the products, not everybody's like everything in life, but for the most part, like it's just like, you're just wired in, right? It's just, they're just doing cool shit that they're, they're trying to make differences. Um, I don't know. It's just, the energy is just so nuts, like just so nuts. Yeah. And I and like it, to start at trade shows like that. CHFA is no, no exception. Smaller I go to the scale, back. same idea. It totally is smaller, but yeah. I, I started the back, you know, in, in mm -hmm. poker, in poker, there's a term, you know, if you have a chip and a chair, you know, you're still in it. And right. those people at the back, they have the worst trade show placements and they've got their little table with their tablecloth and their little yeah. pull-up banner. And they've got their <laughs> flyers and they can't even afford to give out samples. But they're there and they're trying and they're watching and they're learning. And next year they come back and they're halfway in the room. Yeah. And yeah. they've got, you know, a display and a little video yeah. and they've got they some a little product. More polished. And a little polished. And they're just, yeah. you know, those people, 
you know, it's a hard road for them, but if they're doing something that they know can actually like feed people that people will actually want it in their mouth. <laughs> right. Right. Like it tastes good. Um, and if it, it, at the category level, if it's, if it's ticking enough boxes, then, you know, that's really interesting. Don't get me wrong. I love the sexy boots and the big things and everybody you know, does, but who doesn't, you know, and walk whatever. through it on a Sunday afternoon with a couple of tote bags that so you have no idea how you're going to get onto the airplane, but you're still going to do it because, you know, <laughs> you're trying to drink everything before you get to by the, no, actually I found a trick, by the way, the trick is at the last day of a trade show in the afternoon, go through the supplement section because they're the ones they still need to offload product. Their yep. product is worth a lot more money than a bag yep. of chips or a soda, yep. and it will fit in your product. So you can walk home with vitamins and supplements yeah. and powders. And anyway, no, and then See, and then you stop at the people you love. Uh, we 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 met a Aboriginal um, group that was selling um, like uh, old school smoked jerky. Yeah, hmm. traditionally smoked meats, right? And I was like, I stopped there on the last day. I was like, hey, I'm getting on a plane. I'm going to be hungry. Like, I want have time. They're like, oh, here you go. And I was like, okay. No, I, 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 okay. Yeah, I guess I'll, I, I only. I wasn't trying to feed the family. I was just telling them I'm hungry, but that's fine. <laughs> I wasn't trying to feed the whole plane, but okay, I'll yeah. take some. Like, yeah. thanks a lot, right? Like, yeah. the problem is everyone on that plane is from the same trade show. Exactly. <laughs> you can't even hand out snacks. Everyone's like, no, <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, no. You. I got to eat yeah. my bag. Thanks yeah. a lot. Yeah. yeah. I'll yeah. never forget my first expo gut. It was like afternoon of day one where just that combination of all that sampling. Your yeah. stomach is just, and then they're like, "Hey, we're gonna go out for dinner." And you're like, "No, we're not. No, no, no we're not. No. no." Or people ask you at two o'clock, "Are you hungry for lunch?" You're thinking, "Are you kidding me?" We'll be right back. Hey, Kenny. Good morning, Phil. How are you? Half asleep, but that's okay. Excellent, excellent. Um, you know what? You can't be asleep on. Tell me. Um, is we all know it's it's uh, August, but CHFA East is coming. CHFA is coming, Phil. It is. It is. Ah, it, is right. it is not the time to be asleep on this, particularly no. if you're a retailer. Um, the retailers, uh, CHFA has a retailer VIP program um, that you need to sign up for. And, and really don't be asleep because you have to sign up. Well, you got to um, register by the 18th, Phil. Yeah, you got to register by August 18th, right? So that's well, this get month. Your shit together. You know, so you got to get your stuff together, retailers, pay attention. Now is yeah. the time. The um, retailer VIP program has a bunch of benefits. I'm taking a look now. Yeah. what What's there, Kenny? Well, this is pretty cool. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know. For me, I like the first, I like, you know, first one, they, I, I like saving time. So I love the fact that they can mail me my badge so I don't have to stand in line because yeah. that's usually me. I get, I, I typically forget yep. things last minute, uh, Charlie. So I'm, I'm down there late. So yep. that's awesome. So they'll send you the badge by mail. Okay. Uh, they feed you. You get yeah. exclusive breakfast. Yeah. So on Saturday's okay. breakfast, first hundred people to breakfast get a goodie bag. Ooh, that's, that's cool. Pretty cool. Kinda and I cool. bet you just loaded with all the new and cool stuff. Cool. That's um, cool. You get you get lunch all weekend from the food truck station, right? So on the food thing, right? You get all weekend, Phil. Uh, all, all weekend. weekend. <laughs> food trucks. <laughs> well, this is getting better as it goes. It you is. can sleep on rides, so they give you yeah. some. I guess like it gets you get ride discounts on. I'm assuming yep. that's Uber. That's pretty. Yeah, that's pretty Uber cool. discount codes, right? So if you're coming to and from the venue, because the venue is a good one, but it's not exactly easy to get to if you're uh, if you're right. coming from hotels and things like that. So if you got to come from a little bit of ways, the Uber discount codes will help. That's kind of nice. Take you right down there, right? Nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're doing and something very nice overall. And there's some green stuff, planted. right? There's one tree planted in Ontario and this one very kelp, tree. and one kelp planted for every retailer well, in cool. attendance. And it's so very tree, so like it's new. actually yeah. happening, which yeah. is which yeah. Is, yeah. Well, big Not, win, big baby, win big. Every um, retailer who gets them by August 18th gets a chance at 500 bucks Visa Mastercard uh, gift card. I like it. I like it. Oh, I like I it. That one, man. That's huge. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is um, you, you not kind of interesting, but you do get access to incubator alley and then the um, alley pitch session on Sunday. Which is oh, the pitch cool. session would be pretty cool because instead of standing in the aisles and then, you know what I mean? We get all that kerfuffle and commotion. 
yeah. it'd be nice to go into uh, a little more quiet area and actually listen to um, yeah. some of the pitches of the new guys. Yeah. Well, I think team, man. In, in case you're, you're, um, in case you're wondering, so incubator alley is the place where all the new startups go. So you're talking about the hottest new brands, um, folks in, in, um, you know, that kind of play in our space of so natural organic wellness. Um, and then it'll get you a chance. It's know, a busy aisle on the show, right? Like yeah, industry, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, it's all that, it's sort of the yeah. new and cool. So this gives you a chance to, you know, see them in the show, like the show yeah. floor, but yeah. another chance at breakfast to actually um, listen to some of the pitches on it, which I think yeah. is, um, I think that's super cool. That's I think, cool. I think we, Kenny and I were talking about this before we started recording. And, you know, when you go to the show as a buyer, you're thinking about what do I need? Who do I need to talk to? Um, how do I stay alert for new things? And then the incubator stuff is always interesting because they may or may not be ready for you, but usually when you get to new stuff, it helps you think about categories a little bit different or what you that could be doing, thing. right? So having access to the pitch sessions allows you to kind of just stop for a second and zero out the noise of the trade show and just think about like, what do I do with new? How do I do that different? Plus, what, if you're what, sitting what, at a table, like you know what? It's probably going to be table type for me. You're sitting with other people. Yeah. You know what I mean? The discussions so happen. So, stuff. Yeah. Right. And this industry, it's competitive, but still they help each other. So I think that's yeah. a really cool idea. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And you know what else you get, Phil? You get to sit down during the show because there's a, a, a new lounge, a, lounge. a new member yeah. lounge where you can actually yeah. sit on a cup yeah. of coffee and take a break. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, you guys. Can, for you can, an August eighteenth sign up. Uh, you just need to sit in the lounge and then face the other ways, so that everyone who's all the vendors who's got their eyes and faces pressed yeah, up against the glass, you know, you just don't have to look. Go enjoy a coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like this. Yeah. I mean, it's really for, for what signing up, signing up before the eighteenth of August. Now back to the podcast. Hungry for lunch? I'm not. I'm not hungry for lunch for the next three days. Yeah. You know, like. But it like digestively is good for you, right? Like I think one show oh, we 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 ran into Alan Bates who runs um, who was doing Remedy, and every time I walk by Bates, he would give me another kombucha, and I was like, dude, I can't drink anymore. Like I really appreciate you, but I like I'm gonna be in the bathroom for the rest of the show. Like I can't drink more kombucha. Like you can't, you know, digestively my body can't take yeah. anymore. So you just like stop, right? <laughs> If I get thirsty, I'll come that's back. That's the fun promise. of it, right? <laughs> that's the fun of it. Yeah, that's, that's the fun of it. So, that's Corey, awesome. when you were doing, when you're doing your um, old gig but still gig, your your marketing, yeah. I'll call it the marketing agency side. Were you dealing with a lot of these types of brands, and that's what sort of? Because I want to get into ethical food group as well, obviously. But did that lead you into that? How did that? Yeah. Um, no my my lead into ethical food group was you know, it was uh, almost exclusively built on my experience at crew. I just, okay. you know, at, at crew, uh, had such a, has a, such a great market position. And just as a result, I had so many conversations with founders in mostly in Canada, but you know, plenty in the U S as well, but a lot of Canadian founders that were really early on that need marketing help. Um, you know, and at times when crew was the right fit for them, it was very exciting to sort of bring them into the fold. But as you know, <clears throat> you know, founders talking to agencies, um, you know, that there's usually a sticker price issue or yeah. wh whatever. Um, and so I just, I just had a lot of conversations. And so being able to sort of feel like um, the more conversations I had, the more I understood food and beverage, I, um, you know, prior to um, getting into youth work, I was, I, as a kid, I worked in kitchens. I, I was the classic dishwasher turned cook in three weeks because the cook quit, you know? And so I'm suddenly slinging pasta and making pizzas and, and, um, and sort of my life in food service sort of sparked this passion for food. I was, I started, uh, I started my journeyman, my red seal actually in oh, culinary really? arts near at the end of high school. And, uh, but at the time, and I'll be really honest with you, I didn't know any happy chefs. Every chef I knew was an asshole. Every chef I knew had yeah. a horrible lifestyle. And I, after the typically. first year of my journeyman, I'm like, you know what? Yeah. I don't think I want to do this as a career. Yeah. I love food. I love making food. I, I do all the shopping and almost exclusively all the cooking at home. It's because that's my happy place. But for yeah. a career, I couldn't see it. Now, shortly after that, Jamie Oliver took off and, <laughs> you know, sort of, and, you know, had I stayed true and then, you know, stayed to it and then started a YouTube channel in 1998, maybe I would have been okay. But 
it uh, uh, it just wasn't my shoulda. jam. What it so, coulda shoulda did it. What it coulda shoulda. So when I just then to fast forward, when I started my own agency tandem, it was um, it was really about founders and entrepreneurs, and um, for those for the most part, we're in the creative realm. So the the crossover there is that I just love being around entrepreneurs and founders. People that are starting something that is literally their blood, sweat, and tears. It's right. their passion. It's the thing that wakes them up at night or they can't fall asleep. Like if people with those ideas and that drive, I feel like I can support them, whether it's marketing or whether it's, you know, business planning or whether it's relationships or vendor networks or, you know, like all the things that can go into developing a strong business. I just get excited to contribute. So I sort of, I'm a classic generalist. I feel like I'm, you know, capable of at least being in the room or leading, you know, a lot of different types of conversations in business. And it means that as I started to transition away from the from the creative industries, the creativity that's involved in being a founder is actually really high. A lot of founders, they're also generalists in a lot of ways. They're not just, you know, a food scientist or a farmer, or they're usually right. multifaceted. And so that diversity of person who's willing to like, put it all on, you know, black 23, like that person is the type of person I get. So combining my passion for food and, and marketing and entrepreneurship, it's sort of all just sort of, sort of this mixing this pot that sort of came to be. And uh, I do really feel like at the ripe age of 48, I've kind of found my, like I said, I kind of found my people and I kind of found my, my place in it all. And being now in a position where I get to like, it's my job to champion brands that are making good food for people and planet. Like how lucky am I, right? That is, that's insane where I can actually, if there's a brand that's big and amazing, it would normally be a land for any vendor. And I can say, ah, you don't, you don't fit for us. So like Ari. being able to say no, yeah. dude, that's so exciting. Pretty awesome. Pretty it awesome. Is. It is. That's really cool. Um, so out what I was going to ask you. I, I actually have so many things I want to ask you. Um, I guess one from the marketing side, do you, um, are you noticing any trends with the brands that you talk to, you know, what, what they're struggling with these days? Um, you know, there's kind of like, I'm, I'm like you, so, um, pretty much a generalist. I, I love being able to help people kind of like, um, look at, what they're struggling with, look at where all the connectivity issues are and trying to stitch stuff together. But are you finding any trends like are, are brands struggling with specific things at all? Oh yeah. I mean, the, the laundry list is probably pretty long, but from my perspective, <laughs> the two that really stand out, one is that, and this is specific to sort of the sustainable ethical side of the equation for real purpose, like values based brands. Um, they've spent a lot of time and energy focusing on that and as as um remarkable as that is and important as that is you have to win at the category level those category drivers you have to nail them you have to speak to them and and now the the younger demographic of shoppers is coming up where their sustainable um values are more and more important so that is growing but in almost every category, like the top three or four category drivers, the ones that are really moving the needle for brands and getting product off shelf have nothing to do with the sustainability side. Right. So it means that you need to double down on that category and really make sure you understand how you're going to win at that category. The, and so they tend to sort of come to the category elements a little too late and with not enough punch or not enough uniqueness or not a, something right. that's going to stand up for the consumer and really, you know, grab them by the eyeballs and grab them by the stomach and kind of go, oh, okay, the, whether it's the functional benefits or it's the taste or it's the format or it's the, you know, your whole family will love it, whatever it is. They really need to lean into that. <clears throat> and they're sort of as emerging brands, especially with sustainability as a core piece of it. They kind of, they're trying to say too much. They're getting it's getting too confusing you you look up sustainable food and you can get a laundry list of all yeah. the wonderful things that are happening for people on planet but it gets too loud people start putting b corp and all these other certifications on their packaging consumers have no idea yeah. what b corp is it's not driving it so you you when you have whether it's real estate on your packaging or it's in your messaging or it's in the energy you're putting towards it you do have to be really cognizant of a category so i see I see barriers and challenges there. 
Um, the, the second thing is that uh, emerging brands, they, they do get shelf space and they get those listings and they can't support them with marketing. They can't support them with whether it's trade spend or whether it's media or whether it's activations or more importantly, food service. Like people need to get this in their mouth and just work your way to the point yeah. where you kind of earn the trust. And so when brands are going into hundreds or thousands of stores quickly, we all know they're going to get delisted in six months to a year if they're, it might even be faster and because they can't support them. And so I always worry about a brand that seems to be growing quickly when the chances of them contracting quite quickly, um, you know, look at the damage that can cause because yeah. all the free fills and all the extra yeah. production and operations and manufacturing that kind of go into it, like, like it's a hard road. So navigating that very carefully, it's, this is nothing new. Everyone knows this, but I see it really killing brands when they go from, I think that for me, the biggest thing is going from 500 stores to 2000 stores. That's, that's where if they can navigate that well, then those next leaps seem a little bit more, That's such a big they deal. understand them more and it's like they can be, they're a little bit more skeptical and, and paranoid and that's good, right. right? They can sort of be more careful, but it's that like, okay, we're in BC and we're going West or we're in Ontario and we're kind of going out and they sort of, that, that branch out, that's where it's like, oh, do that, do that with, you know, whether you have a groundswell of organic support you know, you've got your street teams. If you've got some media spend or you've got your trade program dialed in, um, you know, whatever it is, you're going to, I've seen, you see these founders who put, you know, they get in their car and they sleep in their car for a week and they hit as many, like you, you're going to do that every quarter, like do that, like support these listings and don't just assume that it's going to come off the shelf because you made it. That's completely yeah. valid. It's, it, well, it, it we, is. we get that, we get that a lot, right? We get, you know, Get that it, a lot from everybody seems, you talk to. Well, it, it's just funny, right? Because the the boil down always seems like a, it seems like such a simple thing, but it's not, right? Because everyone goes, oh, well, so what do you think? Should I expand? Should I, um, you know, should I go wide or deep? And you kind of go, hang on a second. Like I have 1800 questions before I could ever tell you. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, because everyone sees it as a simple thing. Like, you know, do I stay in this market and I go deeper and you kind of go, wait, like, so all the things you just dropped in there, like, what is your sampling program look like? You know, how are you putting this in people's mouths? Like, do you have a plan for if you go wide and there are certain regions that can't, that just don't, they don't agree with you or they don't like your food, you know, like what, there's so many things that we need to ask before you can ever answer that question. Right. Like, yeah. But there's a ton of but everyone says the same thing, right? They go, "What do you think? Wide or deep?" And you're going, "I, I could be know. both. Green but I gotta or red? Give, you got to like, give, yeah. give me a minute, right?" <laughs> well, I think sometimes I wonder yeah. how much time they spend. Like, I, I think it's always the same. I always tell people a good idea or um, a hole in the market doesn't mean there's a business there. It just means it's a good idea, or there, or there appears to be an opportunity. Well, I would argue I mean, that most most founders don't actually know if there is a hole in the market. They I made it because too. they love it yeah. and, and they think that people will love it too. Sure. When you look at, you know, there's very few categories that have holes, let's be honest, right? Well, if there's a so, hole, there's probably there for a reason to some degree. Maybe there's just no demand. Well, yeah. Right? Maybe nobody I, cares. I, I would argue you, you mentioned this sort of, you know, wider, wider deep. I would, I yeah. would argue that like width has nothing to do with it in the sense that if you can't win in your own backyard, doesn't if matter. you're not like killing it in the eight stores that first started carrying your product, if you're not killing it there, and then you go to 15 or 20 or 50, whatever stores, if you're not That's like 500, uh, if you're not really going deep, well, it's not, not going to matter. It's not going to matter. And I think that's no. sort of what we've been, we've been talking a lot about lately too. I'm glad you say that so we can expand on is that I, the idea right now would be go deep, not wide for the, for startups, for sure. Like really get to know, cause I'll tell you what I, the, you've touched on a bunch of points. First off, most people don't understand business in general. So, you know, the idea is great, but it doesn't make a business. When you're talking about the B Corps and sustainability, those are all really, really important. And is, that's the ethos of the company. But does that translate on shelf? I tell you right now, I know how much Coca-Cola gets sold. I know how much shitty cereals get sold. I can tell you all the shit CPG they get sold. It's got shit to do with B Corp. 
People buy because they buy, right? So your messaging, you really have to, you really have to understand those things are critical to, to the ethos of the company and are really, really important. But if they can't translate at shelf, they're just nices at that point, not to yeah. discount it, but they're just nices. Yeah. You know, where, where you go back to what you said is people need to know that this product is really, first off, really good, really tasty, or it really fills a need or solves a problem or whatever it is, really get to understand the category you're going into. Cause all the other shit is just other shit at the end of the day, if it doesn't move off that shelf. And to your point, most stuff does get discontinued within a year. And it's sad. It's sad because people really have some cool ideas and they really want to do well, but they're just a lot of times not set up. The business aspect just hasn't been touched. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, um, I get asked, you know, I've only been an ethical food group for a couple of months now. We just sort of had our coming out party two, three weeks ago at Food Pro. Um, but been sort of like a lot of people saying, like, you know, what is ethical food group? When you know, what are you guys doing? Right. And yeah. um, you know, what we're 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 in we're in startup mode. So what we are today, what we are going to be in three, five years, you know, it's gonna grow and change. You start, you know, we've got a VC side uh, of the business, we have a consulting agent, like we're just sort of we're working on a bunch of things, but one of the things that we see as a problem in the business, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, is that when brands are spending a lot of time and energy kind of talking about, you know, their purpose and their values and why they're here and, and why they why they feel like they're on shelf, um, I think there's an opportunity for a group like Ethical Food Group to sort of champion those values on behalf of the brands so that the brands can focus on the consumer so that the brands can focus on the categories and maybe sort of offload a little bit some of that pressure um because they do want to like some of these founders I, like you talk to some of these founders that are doing work in communities or that are helping farmers that are or like they're really focused on soil health or right. or water uh, preservation mm -hmm. and these things where they're like they they believe these things like these are important to them and that is a part of their story. And so if we can sort of offload a little bit of the pressure of that and help kind of say it in a different way, because they can only beat the same drum for so many times and they just, it's, it's, that's a hard thing to do. I think that there's, whether it's groups like us or others, or just other people sort of picking up those messages and driving them forward. Um, I think that's what's going to take. It's a bit of a community approach to it all where I think we have hard work to do. I mean, the earth needs us. <laughs> right the well we, we need have to make the food system is broken we're like container ships are crossing the atlantic with bottled water yeah it's insanity right so something is very very wrong we have a lot of work to do and you know isn't going to happen with the small food brands that are coming out of alder grove is that going to change the okay let's be honest it might not change the whole landscape but if we keep doing it and more and more brands are uh are doing the hard work and we elevate the brands that are and saying these are the people who are leading they're not the biggest or most profitable or have the most shareholders or whatever but they're the ones that are doing the hard work i think there's a there's a mandate there that i think we can all take on and then especially as consumers to say yeah okay you know what am i going to pay am i going to turn the package over am i going to look at what's going on in the story am i going to go to their website or their, their social and kind of learn a little bit i would argue that the younger audience, the younger shoppers, they're starting to do that a little bit more. Yeah. Are they hitting the QR codes? I don't know. I have my anxieties around QR codes. Yeah, just, I don't uh, know. Whatever. But the point being is that there's more exploration going on. And I think it's up to those of us that have been around for a while to kind of go, you know what? I'm going to put down that, you know, that product and I'm going to pick up this product and it's going to come at a bit of a cost. Maybe my cost a bit more, maybe my... my take my family a little bit more to like it. Maybe it doesn't have the same volume of, you know, it's like 300 grams less than that one or whatever it would be. Um, but you start to pick the ones that are, you know, doing upcycling, that they're focused on regenerative farming, right. that they're doing those hard, good things. Like, I think that's a fight worth fighting. Damn right, so it is. We yeah. got one planet, eh? But, yeah. but I think, I think you, like, as I think what you're banging on is, is really, I do think there's a place for that because I think, you know, the if you kind of back it up a step and just go look at like a simple marketing principle is you only have so much budget and you only have so much time and when you've got to when you've got to compete at category levels it's really hard to compete at a category level and yet still talk about how great this might be for the earth you know what i mean like 
Um, I think one of our favorite chips is is with you guys. So humble, mm-hmm. humble chips, and and so you think of those guys, and you think she's like those two. They need they need to be able to talk about how great the chip is, that it's an organic potato, and that it tastes um, it tastes as good, if not better, than all of the big guys in that category, and that they can compete. Um, and that's like a full time communication strategy, right? As we are a potato chip company, we're fucking wicked at what we do. We do amazing things. Oh, by the way, there's a whole nother strategy that talks about how like the one that the one that kind of like hurts my soul and I talk about a lot because it really hit home for me is every other potato bag that you've eaten lives on the earth for another I don't know, like hundred, hundred century, thousand years, centuries, century, right? Mm-hmm their bags return to the earth in like 90 days, right? And you kind of go, that, it's too much. Like how how does a company like that go about marketing? You know, what, would, that is what a cool normal story. marketing company would struggle to yeah. talk about. And then, by exactly. the way, we're doing these amazing yeah. things for the earth. Oh, and then by the way, if you want this technology, we'll help you with it. Like, yeah. what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Humble Potato right? Chips is a beautiful yeah. example of a brand that's, leaning into a very difficult part of the business. And I've heard naysayers with, you know, uh, say like, oh, well, it requires municipal, you know, programs to recycle it. I'm like, okay, that's true. But (laughs) they're the ones trying. At least they're They're the ones leaning into it. They're the ones that are fighting a good fight. And at at least it's plastic free. And yes, you're right. The composting, there's, there's a opportunity there for music programs to kind of go, you know what, we're going to give this type of technology a nod in our program so that we can kind of do this right. There's lots of work to do there, but we're not going to get to the point with that. The earth needs unless brands like that who are doing performing very well at a category level. And let me, and I'll argue, I think that, I think the, uh, the plastic free bag, my guess is it might help with a little bit of trial. I think it's a nice nod. People buy chips because they love the chip flavor. is a good chip. They love and 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 humble like humble is an interesting flavor approach because they got they got some apple cider vinegar thing yep. going on there. They're they're um their seasoning, I would call it very light. It's not yep. a heavy flavor bully yep. like other chips are doing heavy flavors. So they're going for the consumer that doesn't want a heavy flavor um you know they they're not kettle cooked whereas we've been going kettle cooked all day long i, I like both okay i'm a chip eater i'm a, actually i'm a salt eater i'm <laughs> whatever, like you i can do all whatever, of them. yeah whatever vessel but <clears throat> the 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 opportunity for brands like humble is that they are focused on the consumer and they are making things that people want to eat and then the fact that that shelf space that they're getting that is that much less plastic going into the exact it's a wonderful example so brands like humble you know whether we're able to come in as you know equity partners or value add partners or services or consulting or support brands that are kind of trying to do the hard things it's like we get you we understand and we're going to help and there's times where uh, already you know in just my short couple months already it's like Sometimes marketing is the like we okay we got to focus on your brand we got to focus on your consumer we got to focus on you know these things but sometimes the right business move isn't a marketing move it's like okay we're gonna save that for later there's other parts of the business that need to be addressed in order to grow profit to grow scale to grow right know, to make uh, opportunities happen it's a, it's an interesting game to play for sure yeah yeah no I I think it's cool I I do. <clears throat> I see. I see a need for. I see a need for that. I. I think you're. I think you're in like, just the right space. And then, man, you got you got some, you got some fire and vinegar for it, which I I love. I just, I love it too. I mean, I I think yeah. that's that's most of the battle. And I think you know if there's people like you trying to help these people, I think it's good because I think a lot of what you said. I mean, what I like. We'll go back to humble. What I like about them more than anything, they make a good product. Yeah. I was a category manager. I bought shit right. I didn't care about a lot of the other stuff. Can I sell it? Can I make money? That's my first two, two well, issues. That's the category. That's right? it. You, I don't you can't ask nothing me. else. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bonus. retailer. You can't ask me for, like, I'm here to sell shit and make money. And make money. So, and that's yes, it. And you're here to I pay, want a, the earth pay a to be fee better, to get onto uh, my shelves. Yeah. And I Just, want all the yeah. other bonuses. But if your product tastes <laughs> like shit or it's not going to turn, I really don't care. I hate to say that, but that is the reality. It's a business. 
So I love the fact that they went into it. They make yeah. a really good product. First yeah. and foremost, they make a good potato chip. I can eat their potato chip. Other, I'm like you. I can go deep fried. I can go baked. I can go kettle. I, whatever. I don't really care. I like chips. Kenny, Kenny bought those. We we drove home from New York, and he, he bought American bugles. <laughs> really, there's not a redeeming quality to a bugle. Ex, but the thing is, in the states, I don't know if it's the extra. Oil. No, the American yeah. bugles are how, they're different. Because they're probably they are so extra bad crispy for you. and extra salty. Like so, someone just needs to make <laughs> me a really good it. non. Yeah shite bugle that i will go to yeah. but we're, i can also go to a humble chip in a heartbeat and again a lot of times you'll do it for those right but the first reason has to be i really like the taste and the, all yeah. the other stuff just makes me feel real good that if i got one less bag I actually did my little part for the day very little but it's a part and it's an important part and i think that's that's where they these brands have to really understand and hopefully that's where you guys are teaching them as well is that all the other stuff is critical to your ethos, but really and truly, it's still a business, man. People got to yeah. want to buy this stuff. Right? It's got to taste good or be good or whatever that means. Totally. Can, can I ask, um, so we're, we're running out of time, but it, I think this is important because um, to your point, um, agencies and, and what it costs and things like that, we've, we've, this has been a conversation that Kenny and I have had a lot lately because we've, we've run into some that, you know, some of them are well-intentioned and just, with the wrong clients and then some of them are not so well intentioned and also with Brian, <laughs> um, you know, cause we, we get a lot of, um, brands who will look at you and go, yeah, these guys, right. These guys, um, we should talk to these guys. Like what, what makes a brand fit with you? Um, do you know what I mean? Like you, you think it like we, we talk to a lot of the folks that are in, that go to the same thing, CHFA, BC Food and Bev, Expo. Um, Expo, you know, they've, they've all got some sort of B Corp or um, are trying to do some good things, non-GMO, but what makes, because I think fit um, and partnership is a really big thing that I think a lot of people overlook. They, they kind of roll in and go, what have you done? Well, you should be able to work with me. I'm good. Like, let's go. Right. And, and I generally find that they're surprised when you go, Hey, hang on a second. Like, let's just make sure we actually fit. Yeah. Do we yeah. actually work together? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting question. The, my, my first, <clears throat> well, it's actually more of a gut reaction. And that is that if I was in a brand shoes, I would hope that I would approach it this way. And that I would be looking whenever looking for marketing help or agency help that I would be looking for an agency on record stop shopping projects and where a lot of brands struggling, especially right now where the economy is killing everybody. I talked to a lot of brands who are, to be honest, too small to have this problem. They have too many vendors. They've got their SEO vendor and they got their Shopify vendor and they got their, uh, you know, they've got all these vendors. Now, do they need all of those things firing all at the same time? Do they are do they have the marketing leadership in house in order to handle and manage and drive all of those and make sure they're all talking? Very very difficult. I'm not saying that every brand needs a all full service all in one agency, and those agencies are harder to find. And you know, I, but the point being is that you want to build a great relationship. And sometimes, yeah, you need one project to sort of see if that fit is really right. there. Um, uh, so but I, I think. The idea, like when you go into a, a, a distribution deal or broker deal, these are not one-offs. These are like, we're committing for a while. We hope it works out. It's going to take some time, but you know, a year from now or two years from now, we hope that this relationship will really be beneficial. Right. On the marketing side, that should be the goal too. Do we have the right marketing partner? Even if you have in-house talent, even if you've got in-house people, especially if you have in-house people, you need the right expertise available to you. And you don't always want to be in shopping mode when you need to move the, the next thing. A lot of brands come to us with, a, or have come to me with a marketing problem. And they're like, we need it now. I'm like, we've just met. <laughs> we yeah. might be a fit down the road, but right now, I don't even, I don't even know you. Right. Like I, I, I wouldn't even hold your hand, much less, you know, <laughs> jump into the blood, sweat and tears with you. So let's just build a relationship and be there for each other. And I'm not going to be offended if the first year you still have some vendors helping you with stuff. And maybe I can earn some of that business later on. If I can prove to you, that's okay. 
but it's about an uh, expectation of a relationship. So right. that's my first thing when it comes to fit. The second thing is that there are there there's a lot of great creative talent out there, and there's a lot of great marketing talent out there. And there's every town, Vancouver, Toronto, there's hundreds of agencies and people that can do these things. What you, what a brand needs to do is to figure out, do these people understand my business? Do they understand Shopify and D2C? Do they understand Shopify, D2C and food and beverage, right? right. Where do they understand what it means to talk to a category buyer? If they don't have <clears throat> that level of understanding, then their expertise is going to eventually hit a wall. And if your team internally can't pick it up from there and carry it on, then you need to ch have a partner that can help navigate that. So. Uh, that's why when I talk about when I walked into Expo and I felt like these are my people, it's because I, I felt like that food value chain, I'm going to give a shit about every piece of it. I may have varying levels of expertise. My team, right. hopefully, you know, or the people that are in internally with me can help fill the gaps or experts that I know. But it means that I care and, and will work hard to make sure that I'm supporting all the way through. Right. However, that works for the brand. And so a lot of a lot of agencies land food clients because they're creative, they're passionate, they're talented in their way, and they might have some portfolio work that shows a great brand or a great package, but their work stops there. If that's all the brand needs, that's fine. I understand it. But most cases, especially founders, need partners that have a much wider right. perspective and a, a more specialized food and grocery and ultimately right. consumer perspective. Right. But those That's are questions a really you need long to ask. answer to a short question. It's not though, because no, it's a relevant way to it answer it. I think I don't think so either. But I think that but puts pressure back to the brand. Project shop or you know, figure out what you're shopping for. Because I do know what you're saying. I mean, a lot of it's it literally is a project shop, and it's not probably well, realistic most times it's not the way to be doing it. Project shop because, to me is like when you're well into it and there are small gaps that potentially nobody internally or I don't have the, my agency or whoever I've used may not have that expertise. That I understand. Yeah. I can't tell you how many brands have come to me. A product or a project. Yeah. So brands have come to me for years and said, we need a new website. And so it's like, I would love to build you a gorgeous new website. However, yeah. can we just pause for a moment? Um, your job is to sell more product. And my concern is that you're going to spend a pretty significant amount of yeah. money building an unbelievable website, which we would build for you. Um, but my worry is that it's not, it's not come at the right time right. for you to drive sales. Um, right. So that's just one example. Don't get me wrong. I think it's important to have a website that doesn't make people throw up in their mouth. I think you need a website that does its job. But when it comes to investment, time and focus and energy and all the things that it takes to build a very compelling website, I'd say that there might be other ways to spend that money at certain points, you know, along yeah. the way. So, yeah. Nope. Good answer. Yeah, I think so too. I, I think um, it's funny, the the website thing, it's like the bane of every marketer's existence. But it's always that. It's always a project like that. You know, right. you know they'll come, I want to do, I need better Facebook and Instagram. You're thinking, I appreciate that. I think most people probably think that about themselves. Perhaps we could get to know each other. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what you need. I don't know where, you know, I don't know what you've done or where you're going or what your, what your plans are. So it's kind of, again, I think I like the way you said it, Corbin, because I think a lot of it is project shopping as opposed to really trying to figure out what you're really trying to do. And hopefully you're, the agency you're talking to is as honest as you, you, you appear to be where they'll say, listen, I'm, this is really just breathe for half a second. Let me just ask a few questions and let's see what you might need and whether I'm the right person to fill this need, or do you need to go back and sit down and just rethink this a little bit and then come back to me? We can talk. So, exactly. Good yeah. for you. Cause I don't think a lot, I think a lot of them are just happy to take projects and run, um, yeah. you yeah. know, and again, that's not owned by the agency. That's, that's owned also by the person who sought said project. Yeah, exactly. Right. You get what you ask for some, unfortunately, sometimes. Okay, um, my friends, I got to, here, I've got to get time. this packed up. Mm -hmm. So, but my thing is this: first off, if someone wants to find you, mm -hmm. where and how do they find you? Uh, let's do that first. Yeah, the website's ethicalfoodgroup.com. Yeah, and I'm busy there as well as obviously on LinkedIn, Corwin Hebert. 
and you'll yeah. see me there in the LinkedIn. I'm, I'm, I'm not popular, but I'm, I'm active. <laughs> You're popular to us. Does that make you feel uh, any better? Yeah, it does. Yeah. I, I have, it's, it's nice to have a nice community there and I feel like I've got a wonderful network of food people and industry people. And, and it's uh it's my favorite place to be. It'll only grow. It's, it's it is a very cool industry. Uh, the other thing, I guess, for, uh, I'll, I'll do this for, for probably on behalf of Phil and I um, would have no problem having you come on uh, periodically if you so choose. If you've got something new or cool you want to talk about, if it requires the podcast, would have zero issue doing a podcast with you. If you think it's just something that 10, 15 minutes, a nugget, you know, those days you're thinking, Jesus Christ, if people knew more of this, it'd probably save a ton of problems. Uh, we can record a fast thought with you or whatever you want. Uh, happy to talk to you. Um, That'd be fun. So yeah, there's, especially on the invite. consumer side. Thank you. There's, on, especially on the consumer side, there's some insights that are, that are we're really starting to come out around the sustainable shopper and what Perfect. role they're going to play in sort of the makeup of moving product off shelf and what decisions are getting made. Would love it's just to talk a, about that. So much to unpack there. And it's a little bit of a, to many, it feels a bit like the dark arts of, you know, of the modern, you know, food marketer. And I think it's, uh, it, there's plenty to talk about around that stuff. So let us know what that looks like. Is that a podcast? Is that a bunch of fast thoughts? You tell us. And I think we're pretty much. I'm thinking a, and American gladiator style, like big foam mallets. We just beat the crap out of each other with, you know, spit out some keywords once in a while. What do you say? <laughs> Fuck, I'm I, like yeah, I like I'm it. I like it. I like it. That'd be awesome. But we got to make it even. No two on one shit. Right, it's got to be everybody. You know, man for a woman. Oh, like, Why are you feeling all sensitive? Hey, you think the two of us are going to beat gonna you up? Like, come on! You never know. Get the two you know markers. <laughs> Just so you know, though, if I go with the guy. You know, if I find the weak link and I find someone on it, I'm on that one too. So, <laughs> I'll take you both down. Oh, 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 take it easy. <laughs> settle down now. Just settle down. Remember, it's our only our first podcast. I don't know if I want to hug you either. So, you know. <laughs> you know, I'm just not really feeling the fit, guys. I think the yeah, fit's not there. I don't feel it. Either. You know what? Forget whatever I said. That was all bullshit. That's what I typically say at the end of a podcast. So screw that. Thank you for coming on. If we never uh, see you again, it's too soon. How's that? <laughs> Good deal. Kenny, right. Phil, to have you back. Time. Honestly, man, please yeah. let us know if there's something you want to talk about. We'd yeah. love to talk to you. Awesome. Mucho All blessings, right. guys. Have a great day. Okay. Phil, hang on for a second. You, yep. my friend, have a nice afternoon. Thanks, Rock on. Carry on. Bye, buddy. Hilarious. What's nice is I like I like his approach. I do. Like, I don't care yeah. if you go to Ethical Food Group or not. I mean, I think you should talk to him anyway because I think he's, yeah. he's, he's a guy that probably uh, very similar to us. I think he's a guy that's willing to help you. So I yeah. think, again, if, if this is a great contact for people to have. Uh, if he so choose, you so choose to use a marketing service or ethical food group, I think he'd be happy, but I think he'd be equally as happy to um, potentially direct you in the right direction, which is really, really cool in our industry. Really cool. Like it. Like it yeah, I enjoyed that too. That was really good. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay, my friend, I have to bolt, okay. yeah. um, but I will catch up with you later today. Everybody else, thank you very much for listening and uh, chat soon, baby. Ow. Ciao, buddy, what?